So you read some Marquardt and you read some Nagel. So what did you think of the Nagel reading? What was your take on this? Yeah, Andy. It was a clever starting point, I thought. It was. Why did you think this, Andy? Because it's something that's more familiar to us, and yet it's something that we ignore when we talk about the church. Yes. How about that? All right. We'll elaborate on that more in a minute. All right. Good. Any other initial thoughts? Yes. Was Dustin. he writing this in response to someone? Isn't everybody always writing in response to something? <laughs> well, I, I couldn't tell if he was just trying to um, kind of make his, his point in case someone were to come and attack him or if uh, some point was being attacked already. All right. Well, yeah, that's okay. So what's the, what's the context here? We'll do this. That way the reader can know where we are. Isn't that cool? Yeah, look at that. Except it's a little big, because I can't put the bottom in, because then you can get the information. that's from Concordia Journal, July of 1988. It's this way people can know what we're talking about. I had that thought, and I thought, I could use the camera for that. <laughs> uh, I thought, you know, that's kind of cool. It's almost, it's almost like being technologically savvy. <laughs> kind of daring. <laughs> All right. Now, <laughs> so there's something going on here. Obviously, there's the context. So what's the date on this essay? 88. Okay, 1988. Long time ago for most of you, not for me. Um, so I can remember that time pretty well. So Nagel writes this in 88. Um, what do you know about Dr. Nagel? Any of you ever, ever, anybody ever hear him speak? A couple of you, all right. What do you know about him? Yeah, Simeon. He was over at Westfield House for a while. Yes, he was. He has a plaque there. Oh, he does? Yeah, okay. on the wall. All right, that makes sense. Yeah, he spent some time in, in the UK. That's true. All right. Yeah. Anything else you know about him? I know he was fond of the gilet, which is the French word for vest, the clerical vest. Ah. Okay. One of those. Okay, I think that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Yep. Josh Sasa. Was that? He was a Sasa student. Indeed, he's in that category I gave you last time, along with Feuerhahn and with Marquardt. He was part of that group and very influenced by Sasa, and that is evident in many areas. Okay, good. He was a prof here for a number of years. In fact, he first started teaching here, I think the first year I started here. And so I um, first encountered him for Systematics two on Christology, and um, Dr. Nagel blew me away. Just totally blew me away. And um, after that, I took him for any class I could, any time I could. It didn't matter what he was teaching. I didn't care. It just it was Nagel. So I took him. Um, and it wasn't, I didn't get to take him as much as I wanted to. But um, man, he, he blew me away. And I have told him this many times since. He's now um, retired and I'm living in, over at Laclede Groves. But I've told him that um, he basically saved me for systematic theology and maybe for all of theology. Because in the systematics department, when I'd been a student, I had encountered some um, less than encouraging classes. And um, there was a certain kind of Lutheran scholasticism at work, which sort of felt like there was an answer for everything and everything was pinned down and it was all neat and clean and tidy. And it's like, mm, man, it just drove me nuts. And um, more than once, I would have to leave class and remind myself of simple things like, you know, okay, no, Jesus Christ lived and died and rose for me. And it's not all this listening to scholasticism. I have to go home and play some U2 out the dorm window full blast into the quad, that kind of stuff. <laughs> it would help. It would help. <laughs> Gloria, Psalm 42, kind of nice stuff. Um, you know, obscure U2. And um, so it was not an easy time in those first classes. And then I had Nagel. And it's like, Poof, man. Wow, he actually had the temerity to critique Peeper. Yeah, it's like, dude, tell me more. And um, he, had, he had this way of teaching. And you've heard Nagel stories probably, right? You've all heard Nagel stories? Maybe you haven't. Um, everything you've ever heard about him is true and more. And more. Seriously. So the things like he would walk around with his eyes closed, yes. And he would go up and down the aisle and he would stop short of the wall. Yes, he would do this. <laughs> and um, he would you know, do these wild contortions with his face and even his body. Yes, it's true. He would do this. And he always spoke in his deep, rich accent with his British overtones. It was delightful. And so this was, this was Nagel. And um, this essay, any of you find it a little challenging to read it, kind of keep up with the, where he's going and his style? He writes exactly the way he talks. 
<laughs> exactly. And so whenever I read a Norman an S, a Nagel essay, it's like, oh, I'm back in the classroom. It's just like, just, it's just there. It's just boom. And it's just exactly the way he would speak. Same. Now, the thing that was most notable at Nagel, I'm telling you this just so you can appreciate a little bit of your heritage, because you see, Sasa teaches Nagel, Nagel teaches me, and now I'm teaching you. So you are the great, great grandsons of Sasa. Isn't that cool? See? Seriously, this is how this works. You got to trace back the theological thinking. So I am trying to form you into a Lutheran way of thinking in that tradition. So this is what's influenced me. Now, the reason Nagel saved me is because he actually thought theology mattered. And it wasn't just a matter of checking boxes and filling in blanks and getting the exact same right word that the prof had in mind on a test, otherwise you got it wrong. Um, he was into just kind of, let's do some theology here. And he was wild. Man, we would come into class and say, who has the summary today? And there was nothing organized. You would just would kind of take turns. We figured this out kind of quickly on in the class. In those days, we had class three days a week, so we met a lot. And so whoever was next in the line, and there was no seating chart. You just kind of sat where you sat, but we just kind of just took turns, and guy was standing up in front of the class and say, well, last time, here's what we did. And he would have to recap the previous lecture. This is how every class started. And so the Nagel would sit over here on the side, and he would listen. And he'd kind of sit back and listen, and just stare and think. And if you were speaking good things, his eyes would go wide, and he'd light up, <laughs> and he'd lean forward, and he yes. And if you were wrong, he would go, ooh, <laughs> ooh. And you all knew. You all knew. And you knew what was next. You knew, ah, oh, it's a whole wasted class period. Because now he's going to go back and do it again. And he would. He would. Because if the dude doing the summary didn't get it, we're not there yet. So we'd go back and we hit it again, new angle. You realize pretty soon, it's new angle, but same material. We're doing the same thing again. And he would lead us sometimes, you know, on this kind of little excursions, you know, these little soft thought experiments. We spent like two weeks doing Philippians 2. And he led us down this little rabbit hole. And we were getting down to the point, you know, where is Jesus most like God? resurrection stuff, you know, and all this cross stuff. Yeah, that's kind of in the problem. And we realized we were gone, spending two weeks going down a dead end, totally wrong. And he, he just led us, you know, led the whole class down this thing. And we were kind of, suddenly we realized, oh, blow my mind, you know, just awesome. <laughs> so then for the paper, he comes in and, you know, he's, oh, we should have a paper for this course. Okay, whatever. He, there was no syllabus. <laughs> there is no syllabus. You come to class, he starts lecturing. You just start taking notes. Whatever, whatever, who knows what's going on. So he comes to class one day, pulls out his, his CPH little red book and says, Oh, Festival of St. James, your paper will do there. Okay, what paper? <laughs> paper. So then you had to go and meet with him and talk about your paper. Then he, you would write your paper and he would say, Now you should, you word kind of gets out. He never really says this, but you figure out from talking to other students, he expects you to come in and talk to him about your paper after you've done it. And so I did that. So I go to his office, which is now Dr. Herman's, and you open the door, and you walk in and just get blown away by the smell of cigar smoke. And then he says, here, come on in and have a seat. And so, you know, you sit down, and there's a wood chair, and you're going to sit there like a good student. And he says, oh, no, there's this big, deep, cushioned, upholstered thing there. And about six inches off the floor, he says, no, you, you have the womb chair. And so... So you sit in the womb chair and you just get swallowed by it. You're about six inches off the floor, you know, when you're in this thing. And then he sits down and he's looking for your paper. He's got a stack of papers that which you recognize some of your classmates in this stack. And he looks at you and you realize he doesn't know who you are. So you say, I'm Joel Bierman. So he looks through. Ah, oh, here it is. He pulls it out. And he sets it down and he starts reading it out loud. The whole entire paper <laughs> with you sitting there. And he says, oh, you chose this for a reference. I, I have no idea. I was trying to pad my bib. What do you want? <laughs> Are you serious? And this was, this was Nagel. This was the experience. So I still remember the final exam. Sorry to just indulge me here a little bit. So I still remember the final exam. Coming to class, we sit down for the final exam, and he just writes on the blackboard, in, in the arms of the Virgin, on the altar, and coming in glory. That's it. And we're supposed to get our paper out and write. <laughs> yeah, systems too. How'd you like that for a final? That was it. And we did. So away we went. So, 
So it was, it was, it was a blast. And so I have profound respect for the man. Um, he came in for our last class period. This was the after the final exam because the final was on the penultimate class period. And he came in for the final exam. and said, "So what questions do you have? What should we talk about today?" And so we went around the room and he took a poll. He wrote down all the different topics, and then he proceeded just to kind of wing it and talk about all those things. And he pulled together this incredible lecture where it's all coming together. And that's where he said that he's got more gospel than we've got sins. It was in that very lecture I remember it. Oh, man. So I have great respect for the guy. And that's what's going on here. Now, as I said, it's not the easiest essay to get through. All right? But this essay is extraordinary. And Andy's already picked up on one of the key points. Because what is the brilliant rhetorical move he makes right off the bat? What does he do? He titles this, we're going to look at the office of ministry and the holy con and the confessions. So what are, you, what are you thinking is going to happen? What's this going to be? Where is it going to go? AC5. And then we'll have a big debate over what does AC5 really mean? Is Tappert right or not? Now, when I say Tappert, who do I mean by that? What do I mean by Tappert? The previous. What's that? The previously required edition. This was the previous authorized edition of the Book of Concord. All right? The one you carry around, the big beast, blue Kolb Wengert, came out when? In 2000. So Kolb Wengert is 2000. Tappert was the official English edition before that. All right? And so that's Tappert. So Tappert was the official version, and that's what everyone would use. And so you would think we'd have that big debate. Big debate. And Nagel points out a few times in this essay where um, Tappert has a bit of an agenda. And it comes through, and we'll talk about this, but Tappert is typical of kind of the Missouri Synod, who is sliding off in that kind of congregational direction. All right? That's kind of what's going on. That's sort of the default position all through the 20th century. James. When did Tappert uh, get his edition? Yeah, I'm trying to remember when it was first officially published. I'm gonna, I want to say the 50s. I'm sorry to ask. Yeah, I'm, I'm I want to say the 50s, but I have to double check. Okay, someone could probably look it up and get it for us because you got nothing else to do here. So, you know, just Google it. Um, and you can tell me. Um, so, Tappert was the, was the one we used all the way through, which is when, when, when Cole Wenger came out. It's like, yes. 1959. 59. Boy, did I call it. All right. All right. So, 59 is Tappert. Thank you for that, Dan. All right. So, this is part of what's going on here is you expect him to come after, after Article 5 and get into a debate about what's it really mean. Is Article 5 only about the priesthood in general and then an office derived from it, which is what Walter seems to hint at in Kirk and Amt, or is AC5 actually about their predict Amt? But instead, where does Nagel start? <coughs> With the catechisms. Why is this a brilliant rhetorical move? Yes. Because the catechisms are the less expected in this, uh, the le less expected confessions in this. Correct. It's clearly less expected. Absolutely right. Why else is this brilliant? More accessible. Quite accessible. Who's, who's got the catechism memorized? Lots of people. Everybody knows it. We, we are used to it. And what's our general attitude toward the small catechism? Simple, easy, non-confrontational. Just everybody loves it. And it's, it's benign. There's nothing hard there. There's nothing confusing. It's just it's written for little kids who are crying out loud. This is good stuff. And we can sometimes forget that Luther said, you know, I never master it entirely. I'm always working on it. Well, oh, come on. Oh, that's a little, a little hyperbole, but it's just for little kids, after all. So it seems innocent and very safe. All right, so that's part of it. And why else is the catechism a brilliant first move? Well, it has the stamp of Luther himself behind it, which is always a nice thing, okay? Because it's coming, coming from Luther, and that's part of what's going on. So Nagel's going to start there, and that's what he does. And this is, this is brilliant on his part, because he just kind of disarms the reader. Oh, a small catechism whatever. Yeah. And then he just builds his argument and away we go. Now what we're going to do with the time we have here is we're actually going to kind of crank through this essay and pick out things that I think are significant. If something matters to you, ask about it. But we're going to unpack this and I'm going to try to explain some of what's going on here so we can appreciate better. Now another thing about Nagel is he knows his history. And like a good systematician, his history and his systematics are welded together all over the place here. And he's talking quite a bit about that whole Walter stuff. Why is the Walter history so important for Nagel's discussion? It shaped the LCMS, and it is the immediate background behind his whole discussion. So when asked, 
Dustin said. Who is this? He writing against one person. Not really against a person, against the real movement. This is the time in the church, in the LCMS history when church growth was going gangbusters. Okay? And church growth was kind of like the thing that everybody was into, and it was everybody was on board with this, and it was being officially sanctioned at district and synodical level. And Nagel was a little more than suspicious and not so enamored of it, to say the least. Okay? And one of the key tenets of church growth is this whole idea that I've kind of hinted at other times of everyone a minister. You are all the ministers here. The pastors are just the, the coaches. We're just the encouragers. You're the ministers. The real ministry here is being done by all the people. And so what was going on was this kind of movement that happened in the 20th century. This happened across all Protestantism of trying to empower the lay people. And they were doing it though, usually in a zero-sum game, at the expense of the clergy. And typically it was the pastors who would say things like, oh, I'm not anything special. I'm just a priest like you are. I'm just like a sheep like you are. I'm here just to encourage you and help you and equip you to use your gifts. And this notion of the office of the ministry is still prevalent all over the church. And I'm not doubting that many of you hold that in your heart of hearts. I just love Jesus and so does everybody else. We're all going to go out and do ministry. I'm just going to help people find their gifts and use their gifts to serve God. That's what I'm here for. And that was just the running thing. Now, a low view of the office of ministry fits that perfectly. A view of AC5 that this is really talking about priesthood in general fits that perfectly. That's the context. And Nagel, writing this in 88, is sort of a strange, lonely voice suggesting something otherwise. And that's kind of what's going on here. So he, his target really is kind of the whole flow of the synod at this point. That's what he is saying. Now, wait a minute. What's really going on here? And he wants everybody to stop and rethink a little bit. That's what he's up to. Is that making sense? And the reason he has to talk about Walter so much is because Walter is the dominant influence and everybody who's promoting all this laity can do it all sort of stuff. And pastors are just, you know, player coaches. Everybody who's promoting that is using Walter to support it. Because after all, didn't Walter say, we all have them, this office and we are all doing this and, and they, they were just pulling stuff out of Kirk and Amp very conveniently and there they had their case made. So that's what's going on here. Okay, media context making sense? Now, what Nagel's going to help us with then is we're going to finally start kind of sorting out the issue to answer the question of where are we going to come down on this thing? Are we going to see this thing as a clerical view? Oh, one of these is going to work. Is this going to be a matter of seeing this in a kind of clericalist way? And by clericalist, what we're talking about is a hyper understanding of the office. And so this would be a top-down sort of a thing. Or is it a congregationalist way? And there we have the nice idea of everyone gets to be a minister. And this is kind of the hyper um, priest sort of a thing. And priest in the broadest sense, the priesthood or the people. And we can also make the connection. This would be in the sense that the authority is from the bottom up. And so here we have much more of a um, hierarchical understanding. And over here we have a much more democratic understanding. All right. So then the question is, which one's it going to be? How are we going to sort this thing out? What's the answer? And I was, we were dealing with this last time. We were trying to work through CFW. Now today we're going to try to put a finer point on it. And in my opinion, I think Nagel provides an outstanding answer to this. And Marquardt finds the same answer. Which shouldn't be too surprising. They have the same teacher. And there's some consistency here. And so in Marquardt's seven pages you read on the Uber Trogans letter theory, which is his big issue, he is basically coming down the same point. And maybe you didn't catch it through all the nuances and all the subtlety, but there's a lot going on here. All right. So... Nagel's going to start there. Now, he starts off by talking about the whole Enlightenment time period and what's going on with, with Walter and Walter's context, because what he's trying to point out is Walter was already, as part of the Saxon immigration, making a move away from the Enlightenment understanding, which was this kind of a watering down, liberalizing of everything, and they're making a choice to go back to the confessional move. So that's part of what he's getting into. We don't need to spend too much time on that. But now we can get up to the, um, the real point, which is the bottom of 284. All right? So we're at the bottom of 284, and I'm going to be in about the um, oh, last 12 lines or so. It is written, apostolic scripture, apostolic ministry, apostolic church. We believe, teach, and confess. Hence the ordination vow. 
and this is a great take he has on this. Um, Nagel's little essay is just full of these nice, great little one-liners. You can go home and type them up and put them on your <laughs> refrigerator or on your dashboard. It's good stuff in here. So he writes, hence the ordination vow. The pastor's charter against those who would have him preach and teach otherwise, and the people's charter to which they are to hold their pastor. So your ordination vow is what makes you say, here's what I preach and what I teach. Why? Because I promised Christ. Who cares what you think? And the people's charter to make sure that their pastor does what he's supposed to do. Quit telling us stories about the latest blog you're reading. Tell us what God's word is saying. Okay? So that's pretty cool. And he goes on. What is at stake is the preaching of the gospel. No preaching of the gospel, no church. No preaching of the gospel without a preacher. And, but better, from the Lord. All right. So we want this tip to be coming from the Lord. Now we have his outtake. What is the office of the keys? Quote, It is the peculiar church power which Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of penitent sinners, but to retain the sins of the impenitent as long as they do not repent. Where is this written? Thus writes the Holy Evangelist John, chapter 20th, and then quote. And then Nagel writes, there it is. <laughs> this is a classic. It's like, okay, we're done. And immediately the reader's thinking, well, what was that? Because, I, yeah, so what? But this is his point. There it is. And then he makes the concession. We're on 285 now. These words did not flow thus from Luther's pen. What's he talking about there? What's he talking about? Part of the asterisk in your small catechism. Yes, this is the asterisk in your small catechism because this is in the part called the Office of Keys and Confession, the fifth chief part, right? Who wrote the fifth chief part? Not Luther. You should know this. You took Confessions 1, didn't you? Of course you did. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right. So, Luther did not write the fifth chief part of the small catechism. Shock of shocks. In fact, for Luther, the only part, the parts of the small catechism that really matter were the first three. He threw in baptism and Lord's Supper later on because they seemed like a good thing to do, but they weren't part of the original. And then later on, shortly within his life, somebody else was throwing in a sixth chief part called the Office of Keys and Confession and they're publishing it as his. And Luther's response to that was apparently, okay, <laughs> fine. Yeah, that's, that works. So he was fine with it, but he didn't write it. Now, Nagel missed this. These words did not flow thus from Luther's pen. Why is he conceding this? Because he doesn't want some small to come along and say, well, you know, Luther didn't write that. So Nagel's saying, yeah, I know he didn't write it. Of course he didn't write it. So he's just kind of conceding that, making sure that's clear, so no one's going to try to play that little card. So then he says, it would not be difficult to gather them from his writings. In other words, is this teaching consistent with Luther? Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. It's there. It's Luther's teaching. He approved it. And it's in the Catechism. And it's in the Confessions, which is why this is such a cool move that Nagel's making. Because it's confessional status. He can't argue with it. So then he goes on. Here's a great line. Who wrote them is not important. What they confess is. There's the hallmark of good theology. Teachers slash pastors. And that's a synonymous term. Teachers and pastors are the same thing in theology. And this idea that the teachers in the Bible is talking about Lutheran grade school teachers, never, ever, no way, uh-uh, forget it. So uh, go home and tell your wife she'll be, you know, your good Seward grad or RF grad. Uh, teachers do not appear in the Bible. They're not there. Anytime a teacher is mentioned in the Bible, it's talking about a pastor. Adam. That's the case why we call teachers. Well, that's another topic for another time, and I have it set aside. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. All right. Teachers slash pastors are anonymous, interchangeable instrumentalities. What a great triumvirate there. Anonymous, interchangeable instrumentalities. It is good that we cover them up with vestments and not pay attention to them, but only to what they have been given to preach and teach and do. That's awesome. You see, when you're in the office, it's not about you. It's about what you're there to be. And I love what he says. So you cover them with vestments. You don't look at them. Look at the vestments. You see the vestments that says pastor. That's the whole point. It's the whole point. Because so we're not looking at them. We're looking at what they're there to give, to deliver the goods. And he goes on. 
gathering things from Luther's writings can be hazardous. Not thus is doctrine established, and there is always the risk of just picking out words that seem best to fit what we want to say. Agreed. He needs to be heard all the way through, and not as those who do who can find the quotations to the emergency situations of the 1520s. This is exactly right. In the 1520s, Luther is pushing hard against Rome, pushing hard against papal authority and papal supremacy. And so Luther says crazy things like, who needs a stinking pope? We don't need priests. We get, we're all just priests. We don't need this. And what's Luther doing? He's pushing against the foil. And so when Walter is quoting those kinds of quotes, well, yeah, because that's the context. But you have to be careful. Is that all Luther has to say about the topic? No, not at all. Important. All right, then we go on. Great quote. Next line here then. Luther's congregation principle can, be, can as little be played off at, against the office which is committed as the task of arranging things as can universal preaching be played off against the office of preaching. Exactly. He's quoting this other person. Now, what he's already saying then is this. If this is going to be the office and a high view of the office, and this is focusing on a high view of the laity, the mistake we cannot make is to play these off against each other. So now already early on in the essay, Nagel's already cut to the heart of the whole matter, which is these are not in competition. But guys, you're all going to encounter people all the time yet today who are going to play these two off against each other all the time. You're going to hear people who are being high on the office who want to tell people, you know, you can't forgive sins and you can't talk to people about the gospel and, you know, you're pretty much here just to receive what I had to give. And you're going to hear people saying, well, you know, the people have all the real authority, and they're the ones who really do ministry, and the pastors are there just to kind of organize and give it some vision and some direction. Well, this is stupid talk. Both of those are stupid talk because you're playing them off against each other, and you're trying to elevate one by pushing down the other, or elevate this one by pushing down the other. That's exactly what Nagel's saying you cannot do. Now, the reason this is important is because Nagel has come to be, for many people, especially on the side trying to elevate the office, kind of one of their heroes. You know, oh, yeah, high view of the office. You know, Nagel, Nagel, Nagel. And they do that often and start tearing down the role of the people. And you have, you have to hear what Nagel's actually saying here. Don't play them off each other. All right, so that's the first big move he's making here. All right, now we go down to the bottom of 285, and now we take a little hiatus, and we get into a key beautiful, powerful principle of good Lutheran theology. And this is awesome. I'm about nine lines up from the bottom of the page. This is forgiveness, not floating about or just wished for, but delivered by the Lord through the mouth of his servant, the confessor. The vital locatedness of this delivery point is explicated in the answer above to the question, what is the office of the keys? Without this, it would be impossible to confess what is confession in the way it is confessed. Here is something which happens only in the church. That is where the delivery of his gift is located, but surely located on earth. Here is the point where sins are confessed and forgiven by God. The church is where holy absolution goes on. Lose that and the church is gone. Now, let's pause there before we finish his nice tour de force. What's his point? What's he mean by the locatedness or the there it isness of it, as he says earlier in the paragraph? James. It sounds like the visible aspect of the church. Precisely. It's the visible, concrete reality that this is where forgiveness is going on. And this is what goes back to the AC5 stuff I was giving you on day one. Grace is in AC4. Where does a dude find the grace he wants and needs? He finds it where God delivers it. Where does he deliver it? In his church, through his called and ordained servant of the word. That's where it's going on. That's what he's there for. And so, you see, this is one of the beauties of this thing. A person who's seeking God's grace does not climb into his closet, get down on his knees, and pray the sinner's prayer, and wait for his heart to feel strangely warmed. There's no hope in that. Because, oh, Okay, that's cool. What happens when it wears off? What happens when the temptation comes and you fall flat and that strange warmth is gone and instead you've got emptiness inside? Now what? Go on and try it again? Try to ramp it up one more time? That's what people do. And they're left wondering, where's the grace? Here's the cool thing we have in Lutheranism. This is just such a beautiful thing. When a person needs to find grace, where does he go? You just go to the divine service, go to the altar, kneel, and it's shoved in your mouth. Did I get it? I can still taste it. I'm still picking out little pieces of crumb from my teeth. Oh, I got it. It's real. 
How cruel is this? There's no doubt about it. And if you're really plagued by some particular sin, what do you get to do? You get to sit down with your pastor face to face and say, let me tell you about it. I've sinned. Here are the specifics that are troubling me. And you spell them out in the, the air for everyone to hear, you and the pastor and any angel who happens to be around. And you spell it out. And then what does the pastor do? He looks you in the eyes, eyeball to eyeball, and says, I forgive you your sins. Gone. You're not left wondering. It's gone. Well, how do I know? The pastor said so. Well, who's he? <laughs> Only the called and ordained servant of the word. Only the one who speaks with the authority of Christ himself. Only one who stands there and says, my word is Christ's word. That's all. Guys, how huge is this? You get to walk around and deliver people absolution. Cut them free from their guilt. Set them right with God. Holy smokes. This is what Nagel's getting at with the locatedness. This is what a pastor is all about. He's the guy to make sure this happens. That's what he's there for. That's why he is the steward of the mysteries of God. He's there to make sure the word is being preached, the absolution is being given, the baptisms are going on, and the Lord's Supper is being offered. That's why he's there. That's what it's all about. So that's what he's getting at here. So now, here I am on top of 286. The church is not left floating. It lives where the gift lives, the peculiar church power. The gift is where Christ has put it. He said it and did it. Where is this written? The Lord Jesus, Jesus the man crucified. He showed them the marks. The Lord indestructible, and it is all his operation. You see how concrete is that? Look, Thomas, shove your hand there. How real is this? And that real Jesus gives a real gospel to real men. All right. To the disciples, his breath, his spirit, his words, one flow, not to be broken into pieces, no piece by itself, into their ear holes. Oh, this is so nagel. The breath, the spirit, words of the Lord Jesus, mandated to come out of their mouths, his words alive with his breath spirit, whose work it is to bring home through ear holes the gifts that the words say and bestow. And now, here's his ace. He's been holding it. And now he's going to play it. What do you believe according to these words? And now hear the freight of these words. I believe that when the called ministers of Christ deal with us by his divine command, especially when they exclude manifest and impenitent sinners from the Christian congregation, and again, when they absolve those who repent of their sins and are willing to amend, this is as valid and certain in heaven also as if Christ, our dear Lord, dealt with us himself. How much higher view of the office do you want? Good night. You see, and so, like I said, Nagel's just, pow, played his ace, and everybody's like, dude, you win. It's just that clear. All right, so we go on. So, now he's got his whole thesis kind of laid out, and now he's going to start unpacking this a little more for us. And so, he's going to talk about how this is works in reality. So at the very bottom of 286 then, the last line. If the only church you can be sure of is invisible, that doesn't really help. Here the church spoken of is his church on earth. Cut that out and you waft off to invisibles. You get this? Do you, are you grasping why this is mattering so much? You see, if I believe in the invisible church, well, that's cool and that feels nice, but where do I find that? And if you're left, you know, reading some great devotional literature or cramming through your Bible in your quiet time trying to find that, you're in for a real problem because it's not tangible. It's not where he's promised to be. It's the whole point. All right. Now we go down to um, 287. I'm at the um, final full paragraph. Were the disciples church? Yes. Were they pastors? Yes. There is no break or hiatus in the progression. Christ, church, disciples, pastors, holy absolution. See, this is the whole progression. So there is a progression from Christ to his church, to the disciples, to the pastors, to the absolution they give. No part may be excised nor isolated out as dominant. All together are from the Lord. The church does not make itself church. The disciples do not make themselves disciples. Ministers do not make themselves ministers. They are all given to do, to be what they are from Alpha Christ by the Omega of his forgiveness, surely delivered by the called ministers in holy absolution with the words given them to speak by the Lord Jesus. All right. So far, good? Questions, observations? 
All right, 288, third paragraph. We have come into the Augsburg Confession. Now he finally gets to AC5. Now he finally gets to AC5. And now, like I said, he's already laid everything out, and he's already got the argument won. Now it's just time to put some gravy on it. So AC5. We have come into the Augsburg Confession at the forgiveness justification point and found the same connection with the office of the Holy Ministry. Here's my favorite line in the essay. A pastor is good for nothing but the delivery of the forgiveness of sins. Man, put that on your keyboard, put it on your refrigerator. A pastor is good for nothing but the delivery of the forgiveness of sins. Don't forget it. That's what you're there for. And that's why a pastor should see himself as absolution man. I'm here to deliver the absolution. You should put a big A on your chest, preferably not red. And then... <laughs> And whip open that alb, and there it is. Absolution man here. What's my call? Forgive sins. That's it. That's what I'm here for. I'm the forgiveness man. I'm here to deliver the gospel. And I deliver it through baptisms, and through the Lord's Supper, and through absolution, and through preaching the word, and through counseling. But I'm here to deliver the forgiveness of sins. That's me. Absolution man. It was at this point that I started to feel really uncomfortable because he's throwing relationships out the window. What do you mean by that? Like... What about building relationships with the pastor to get those? Things? James, don't don't assume he's ignoring all of that. It's not like the pastor sits in his office and blogs all day and just shows up on a Sunday. <laughs> That's I what mean, it feels like. no. <laughs> Sadly, that attitude is out there. No, the, he 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 is engaged in his people because he's the absolution man. He needs to know them in their lives. He needs to be there in their lives. He needs to be there delivering this grace. And so, no, it's not a matter of just kind of, he appears you know, like a cuckoo clock and, you know, pontificates from on high and then disappears again for another, you know, week. No, this is not, it's not it at all. This is just the end point. It's the point he's, keep in mind, what's his context? He is trying to drive home the uniqueness of this pastoral office. And what is what is the foil in the mind of Nagel through this whole essay? It's that whole, hey, pastor's just a dude like you are. He's just a player coach. He's just here to encourage you. He's just one of the guys. He's nothing special. And then sadly, it was pastors who would tell people this all the time. No, I'm nothing special. I'm nothing special. And what Nagel's getting at is, fine, great. Steal my pastor from me. Now what do I have left? See, this is, this is the driving point we need to get here. And this is kind of what Mark White's getting at in his, his little essay, too. And he makes some good quotes. That this is not about trying to save your ego or trying to bolster your position. It's about making sure that people get their absolution, man. Now, to his credit, Nagel lived this. He was always in chapel. Didn't matter. Always in front. And it didn't matter what was going on and how goofy the service was or how bad the preacher was. He was there because the man who was preaching was his absolution man for that day, and he expected him to deliver it. And he, was, he could be quite critical of the preaching of go on. I can remember classes after we'd had the sermon, and he'd come to class and just make some kind of comment about, well, we hear about, you know, we have a good example today of what God calls us not to do. Or, you know, this kind of thing. You know, <laughs> It was often more subtle than that, but it would be very clear that you know, he was dismissive of what had just gone on, and yet he was there expecting the guy to do what God put him there to do. So he's consistent with this. This is very cool. So a pastor is good for nothing but to deliver the forgiveness of sins. Attention is not directed to him, but to what he is there for, as servant and instrumentality, the gospel and the sacraments. It is God who does the verbs. And that is so classic, Nagel. Who's doing the verbs? If you're doing the verbs, it's the law. If God's doing the verbs, it's the gospel. This is classic Nagel. And he, I don't, I, just to, to be clear on this, Dr. Nagel and I would have our differences. Um, you know, he, he tends toward a law gospel reductionist way of seeing things. Where the law basically just kills, kills, kills. And I have a much more robust understanding of the law. So there's some differences there. And I'm not quite ready to go as far as he does on some of his um, seeing the sacraments everywhere. But um, by and large, I, I, have, I owe him a great debt, of course, as I've already made clear. All right. So. This is the whole point. The pastor is there for the delivery of the forgiveness of sins. Now, the key, key statement in the bottom of 288 and the 289. So over there, the last three lines on 88. By way of confessing the office of the keys, the office of the holy ministry is confessed. To be put into the holy ministry, product omt, is to be given the office of the keys. This is the whole point. What goes with the office of the keys is to preach the gospel, to forgive and retain sins, and to give out and administer the sacraments. That these things be done flows from Article 4, justification. What is confessed in Article 4 is confessed as given out by the ministry of preaching, predicomped. 
When gospel and sacraments are given up, they are the means by which the Holy Spirit works faith in those who hear the gospel. This faith is the such faith at the beginning of the article, Article 5. Faith given the gifts confessed in Article 4. The forgiveness of sins and righteousness, righteousness before God for Christ's sake. The faith that receives the gifts as the gifts they are is worked by the Holy Spirit. The way, means, instruments he uses are the means of grace, the preaching, teaching of the gospel, and the giving out of the sacraments, whose instrumentality is the ministry instituted by God. Boom. Okay? This should be something sort of like common. Everything's kind of coming together here. All right? Good. So, then we go on. So we got the seventh, he, said, he talks about how the, this is so good, Nagel too. he says, Article 5, next paragraph, is concerned with the gifts and they're being delivered. This happens by way of means of grace, so they may be going on, God has given us the ministry. Where they're going on is the church. The church comes in seventh place. <laughs> because, well, it's supposed to be kind of funny, okay? The church gets seventh place, because you've got AC 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So the ministry gets fifth place. New obedience gets sixth place, and the church gets seventh place. It comes in seventh place. It's down the list. All right, it's a little, little funny by Nagel. All right. Now, two dangers come in here. Two dangers, bottom of 289. One danger is a man who puts himself in the office. Second danger, a Roman bishop who says only he can do it. And so we have both those dangers dealt with. Article 14 deals with the first problem. Can any man put himself in the office and claim the right to go around forgiving sins? No. Can't be done. Can't be done. So no man puts himself in the office. Anyone who puts himself there is not in the holy ministry. A minister is not accountable to himself. No accountability, no minister. Okay? So clear cut. That we have. All right? <laughs> and so then we have the great Luther quote on 290, reinforcing this, and we don't need to pound that home because it's coming pretty clear now here. Um, and then we have the congregation's duty to choose the pastor. This is so important now. So in other words, if you have to have the gospel going on, and it is the minister, okay, and this is the full blast minister, predict umpt, okay, if it's, you have to have that, then how necessary is it to have a pastor in a congregation? It is essential. And this fits. Remember how in Walter I pointed out to you when Luther had his seven marks of the church? Remember what Mark 5 was? Mark 5 was the office of the holy ministry. In other words, there's a pastor there. This is important. A congregation that wants to claim that it's a congregation and has no pastor is not rightfully a congregation because you have to have the gospel going on, and there has to be the man put there to make sure the gospel is going on. That's critical. All right. I know you're all wheels are turning. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. I'm going to stand by it. Adam, go ahead. So if a congregation loses its pastor for mm -hmm. whatever reason, mm -hmm. and has someone filling in in the vacancy, mm -hmm. for the duration of that vacancy, is not a congregation? No, 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 no. Because is the pastoral office in their midst? It is. And the key is, and see, even if a congregation loses, a pastor takes a call and they're vacant now for, you know, a year, year and a half, two years, and they're trying to get a pastor. Is the office still in their midst? I would say yes. And the very fact that they're calling shows this. So that's fine. And they can have an interim guy. They can have some students filling in, whatever it takes to make sure that that office is being honored in their midst. When I have a grave concern is when I hear stories about congregations that are vacant, not calling. That's, that's a problem. Because then it's sort of like, we're just resigned to the fact that we're not going to have a pastor, but we're still the church. And I would say, I think we have a serious issue here. I don't think you are. Are there a lot of congregations like that? Yeah, I don't know the stats, but I hear it. Yeah. James? This makes me wonder about a, a, a chicken and egg problem. Okay. Well, how do you start a church? Well, you start with a pastor. Well, there's mm -hmm. no congregation. It's not a church. Well, so these, are where these, these are where these kind of these organic things are just going to happen, you know, and they grow up. But see, as soon, well, Luther even toyed with this. So suppose a bunch of people get shipwrecked on a desert island, and there's no, no pastor in their midst. What are they going to do? Wait for someone else to get shipwrecked? No, they raise one up. So are they the church in that place? Answer, yes. Can the church in that place choose a pastor? Not only can they, they must. And this is, now this is the driving point I want to get across, and this helps to, I think, shed light on what Walter was arguing for. Do the keys then belong to the congregation? Yes, because the congregation must 
have the keys present so that they can have a man there and so the congregation can and actually must make sure the man is there. So the congregation's role is actually making sure the office is filled. They don't have to rely on someone with holy hands to fill the office for them. They can do that. They have that right. And this is what, if you pay attention to the confessions, what's being argued for in the confessions again and again and again and again is not that every person can do a baptism or everybody has the right to do the Lord's Supper. That's not the point that's being argued. What's being argued is the congregation has the right to choose a pastor. In other words, you don't have to wait for the bishop to step in and do it. That was the second problem that Nagel was pointing out, that, well, only a bishop can do this. And the confessions are clear. No, 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 no. It's not a top-down thing. Christ gives his church the authority to choose the man. But when they put the man in the office, the man is God's man, not the church's man. Okay? So it starts to look like this. We have Christ who gives his gifts, and we will call this the keys, okay? And he gives his keys to the church. So, by definition, what is the church? I'm making it pretty clear now. It is going to be people and pastor. That's what makes church, church. And so, they have the keys. To whom, to whom does Christ entrust the keys? To his church. And the church is the people and the pastor. And they are now functioning with this gift. The church as people put their pastor in the office, but once he's in the office, he is accountable to Christ himself for his use of the keys. And so he has the keys from Christ, and he has that obligation. That's the whole point Nagel's making with the ordination. He has that obligation. Yes, the people are there and putting him in, but he's in the office by God's work through the congregation. So the congregation is the means of putting him there, but once he's in the office, he's in the office, accountable to Christ, not to the board of directors or the elders or the church and church you know, assembly when they're having their annual meeting or whatever, the voters' assembly. So why do we have seminaries? Because the church collectively wants to make sure that the men who are holding this office are equipped and capable of doing it. And that's what rite vocatus means. That the church together has decided that rightly called right now means we want this bare minimum of education. We think it's important to do this. But the church could theoretically say, We'll do it differently. In fact, it's getting harder to afford this education. You get some guy who can read, he can be the pastor. Pick whoever you want. And what's interesting is, we'll get into this a little bit later on, um, think about New Testament times. What made a guy a pastor? Basically, Paul saying, Timothy, you're the pastor. Okay. You know? And that was what Rite Vocatus meant then. Today, it basically means the church needs to recognize you, and here's what the church is expecting for you to do this. But frankly, the church can find it in any way they want. Sure decided. Which is why the SMP flies. Because, well, you don't have an MDiv. Well, since when is MDiv required? What's required is the church saying, this is a man that's certified. And we decide. Okay. Um, kind of the flip side of the question about an empty church, can one pastor serve multiple churches? Sure. I mean... Sure, because it doesn't say, it's not like it's a you know, function with you know, one-to-one kind of a thing. It's a matter of this office needs to be filled. And we have, this church has this man filling this office. Another church has the same man filling the same office. It's fine. Steve's capable of it. He can do this. And this is... we do that, but I would just... That's fine. And we're starting to get to our multiple issue then, too. Can one church then have several men filling that one office? And the answer would be yes. But, and here's where you... I know where you guys are going with your questions... Which one is really in the office? And the answer is yes. Yes. All, of them. all of them. You bet. And this is important. We'll spend more time driving this home because this is immediately relevant for many of you. Is that an assistant pastor in charge of visitation or youth ministry? Um, read glorified vicar. Is um, sorry. Uh, is, um, is every bit as in the office as the senior with all the experience and all the administrative responsibility every bit in the office. And in fact, as far as God's concerned, who's in the office, there's not a whit of difference between them. And this is cool and also terrifying because it means whatever happens in that congregation, you're responsible for. An assistant pastor can't play vicar and say, oh, the senior decided. Sorry, doesn't cut it anymore. Vicars can hide, pastors can't. Dan. This might be a stupid question, but what's the controversy he's referring to on 291? Um, we're not there yet, but we'll get there. So where are you at? Which, well, we'll go there, fine. We're, we're, we're part of the page. Uh, top of 291 after the, the quote. With oh, that's the recent controversy, retrojectionist terms. Yeah, he's, um, I'm not sure exactly which one he's referring to. I don't know. Don't know for sure what, what he has in mind there necessarily. 
a question. What is with the other way around when a church sent a pastor uh, for missionary work when not even yet a yeah. congregation is? Is this also true? Yeah, no, see, this is getting interesting. So what about a mission plant? So congregation says, go start a church somewhere. Now, on what authority is he doing that? Frankly, I would say he's doing it on the, on the authority of that mother church, the sending church, that wants to be faithful to the Great Commission, so we send a man to go take the gospel where it hasn't been gone, gone before. But what happens very shortly after his arrival there? He starts sharing the gospel, and one of his first objectives is going to be what? Find a leader? Start a church. That's just going to be his biggest objective. Let's be a congregation. And we're going to do that. We're going to form a congregation. And then it starts to grow up organically, just like St. Paul. I mean, so it's, it's the sense of, you know, the, how the church grows. And you can also have it where people just kind of end up in an area, like some of the, you know, the people who maybe travel back to Rome, take the church with them, and then they start worshiping. They say, well, what do we need? We need our absolution man. So who's going to do it? Frank, you've got the gifts. You're it. we got nothing else. Frank says, okay. So he, he rises to the occasion, and he does it. He's in the office. Who put him there? Church did. Okay, Adam. More on that later. We're not exhausting this, but go ahead. Uh, in such a situation where you just you have the need, so you appoint this person, and at a later point you realize, okay, now we're in a position where there is whatever further training or preparation, mm. or there's somebody who's more apt to do this than yeah. Um You can't be unordained. Well, you actually can. Because, see, you can say this office needs to be, is going to be filled by this man now, so the church is going to do that. And so that man would step back out of the office, which is why it's one of the big differences. See, we're, and we'll talk about this more as well. We're not done with any of this stuff. Ordination does not grant you an indelible character like Rome teaches. In Roman Catholic Church, once you're ordained, you're a different dude. And it's like, now, in the, you know, turn the lights off, turn the black light on, your hands will glow. Um, because you're, you're, you're different. You have the holy hands. And that indelible character can't go away. And this explains so many things. Like, why won't the Roman Catholic Church just throw out these bad priests? Why do they send them off to these monasteries somewhere or stick them in the back corner of Botswana or something? And the answer is real simple. They're priests. You can't, I mean, they're, they're screw-ups, but they're, they're holy. They are holy. They have the indelible character. That's how it works in their theology. It's just the way it is. We don't operate this way. We would say the man is in the office, and as long as he's in the office fulfilling that, he is in, in empowered with that gift from Christ himself. But should he remove himself from the office, he goes back to just being a priest like everybody else. And this is an important distinction because it doesn't mean this everybody who's got an MDiv can go out and play pastor whenever he feels like it. And I hear about these stories and they make me cringe. You know, the guy who's selling Thriven and he helps out once in a while on the weekend preaching somewhere. No, shouldn't be happening. Shouldn't be happening. But it does. But it's, it's bad practice. Okay? James. Or behind. So okay. Press. Or behind. Well, I mean, I didn't know you that. got more to right. cover, I'm sure. I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate that. All right. Great Latin phrase on 291, second paragraph, first full paragraph down. Ilum nasci hunc fiere. And this is priests are born, pastors are made. Okay? This is a great thing. So there, we neither can nor ought to give the name priest to those who are responsible for the word and sacrament among the people. Right? So we don't have priests. We're all priests. So priests are born at the font. Pastors are made. Quite right. All right. Good. Now. Nagel also admits what Luther says is not doctrine. So we can get some great quotes from Luther, but we've got to make sure we're binding this in the doctrine itself. So that's where he's going. And then he talks about how things were going in the early church in Wittenberg and how the first ordination was in 1525. Now, it's interesting. Um, I haven't dumb, done my digging on this because I don't care that much. But Kolb Wengert says, this is on page 324, that the first ordination in Wittenberg was 1535, even later. And I tend to go with Cole Winger because it makes the case even stronger for what Nagel's getting at here, which is, in other words, the reformers, and this is fascinating, because here are these churches from like 1520 on who are not being allowed to have pastors anymore. The priests won't come because Rome won't send them. And so pastors are dying or they leave or they're losing them. And the churches are looking, for, we need a new priest. We need a new pastor to come here. And the church says, sorry, you're evangelical. You don't get one. And so you would think that the Reformation would say, well, heck, we'll make our own. It took them until 1535 to get around to it. They were that reluctant just to go ahead and do their own thing. Because basically, when they, once they did their own thing, it signaled, hey, we're our own, 
a, a group. We're not your church anymore. They didn't want that. They wanted to stay unified. They wanted to stay as part of the church. They wanted to cooperate as much as they could. And they only reluctantly, kind of when they're forced to, finally said, all right, we'll do this. This is, these are good things to remember when you're thinking about Lutheran identity and our attitude over against Rome. It's not like we're gleefully, you know, kicking them to the curb. It's, it's reluctantly stepping out. No one wants to start a new church. No one wants to be forced apart. All right, so then how did this go? Typical process in the early days was examination, call, ordination. Huh, kind of like nowadays, except examination is preceded by about eight years of school or four or whatever. And so a whole bunch of stuff. But this is how it went. So you had the ordination or you had examination, call, ordination. <laughs> and then what's also interesting, this is 292, where did all the ordinations happen in the early days of the Reformation? Who did them all? Oh, Bugenhagen. Bugenhagen, top of 292. Why did Bugenhagen do them? Because he was the pastor Loki. Okay, you should need to know that term. The pastor Loki, which means what? Not crazy, man. All right. The pastor Loki just means the local guy. The pastor of the place. The pastor of the place. So because Bugenhagen was the pastor of the congregation, this congregation was sending these men out, so that's where the men got ordained. And it's fascinating. They got ordained there in Wittenberg before they went off to their first call. Okay? So there's a, a kind of a pulling apart and recognizing ordination is doing something and the call is doing something and installation is doing something. They're not all just kind of running the same way. This is also quite different. Now, I don't want to get hung up on my own stories, but when I graduated here, I came out of here in 87, and it was drilled into my head, pounded into me by more than one prof. Your ordination is nothing more than your first installation. That's all. Your ordination is nothing more than your first installation. It means nothing. It should happen where you get called. That's where it belongs. Going anywhere else is kind of wrong. That's what it was taught. And so if you wanted to get ordained in your home congregation, well, man, that was like pfft, looked down upon and just really kind of derided and you had to get all kinds of special permissions. That's how it was. Because, and see, what's driving that? What's driving that is an effort to try to kind of tamp down ordination. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. It's not a, it doesn't matter that much. But if you start thinking about the office being a rather significant thing, ordination starts rising a little more in significance because that's when you're actually put into the office. And that's why Nagel here is willing to put ordination a little higher again. And that's what kind of what's going on here because the church is actually putting you into the office and this is significant. And he's got the Reformation practice on his side. And that's to part of his argument, you see. This is all again, part of the rhetorical force of this essay is, look, here's what the reformers were doing. Hmm, maybe we should be paying attention to this. All right, now, let's press on because we have to get to the real kicker here. We're almost to the end of this thing. So, we're at 293 now. <coughs> and um, this is where he's, well, we're at the bottom of 292. And he's talking about the Altenberg debate. All right. So here's the problem. The evangelical preaching of a powerful personality, Stefan, drew him, Walther, not only to the preaching, but also to the dominant personality who constructed an authoritarian doctrine of the ministry that ran to excess and the debacle in Perry County. Ministry overrode the church. So these guys are winning and the church is getting trampled. All right. Vasey would have the church override the ministry. And Marquardt's going to talk about Hafling, another guy who wants congregation to be trumping ministry. Keep the ministry under check. Don't let that happen. So that's what, how we're going to do this. Now here's what Nagel says. The Altenburg debate and then church and ministry are Wal were Walter's confession of both from the Lord. That's the kick of the whole article. Both from the Lord. Not people and then the pastor derived. Not pastor and the people getting his handouts, but both from the Lord. Critical stuff. And then we have, awesome, next paragraph. Stephanism must never happen again. The defense against this, whether a new sense or the smell of it still in his nostrils, tilted Walther's utterances toward church congregation. What's he saying there? That well, the argument Walther's making in church and ministry definitely is tilted in the direction of congregationalism because what was the biggest threat he had? It was Stephanism. 
It was the whole clericalism. And that's kind of what I was hinting at last time. And I think Nagel's right about this. The reason when you read church and ministry, it sounds like Walter's coming down squarely on the congregational side is because the biggest threat he had was coming from the clericalist side. So he has to push against that. And by pushing against that, he emphasizes the importance of the congregation. But he doesn't make the move of saying, finally, and the pastor's nothing more than the servant and the deputy of the congregation. He doesn't do that. And the fact that Walter still puts the man there as God's chosen man changes everything. And it brings the balance. And so what Nagel's saying is, we've got to pay attention to our context and make sure the balance is not getting out of whack. Now, so Walter writes what he does in a context ripe with clericalism and bishops and thinking we need this. And then people read Walter 150, 200 years later when the context is, hey, we're all lay people, we're all ministers, we're all cool. And people, it's like Walter, he is our man. And what happens to the, to the pastor as pastor? <sighs> Gone. And that's why you've got to pay attention to context and history. You can't just read documents in isolation. All right, great quote going on here next. But all along, the small catechism was being confessed by everyone, and when a man was ordained a pastor, the first words were the words of institution. What's he referring to? First act you should do as a pastor when you get newly ordained, you turn around and you celebrate the Lord's Supper. That's how it's supposed to be. It's pretty cool. It doesn't always get to happen that way, but that's how it's supposed to be. And we have this awesome quote from Nagel, the one I put in the quiz. It is all from the Lord, and the gift he gives is the gift he gives. And intentionally ambiguous. All right? So the gift that Christ gives is the gift that the pastor gives, and it's all from the Lord. The pastor is just instrumentality. All right. We get it. All right. Good, good, good. So we fly on. And now we go to um, this whole Tappert thing on 294. And I was kind of making some comments about this. There are some good footnotes where Nagel probes this a little further. But bottom 294, ministers in. And this is Nagel's translation. He puts in here in parentheses, Tapper replaces this with of. The church had the mandate to forgive sins. Now, what's the difference there? If I say ministers in the church had the mandate to forgive sins, or if I say ministers of the church have the mandate to forgive sins, what's the difference between in and of? It sounds like everyone's a minister. Okay. And ministers of are the people who have been Yeah, that could be. I think he's trying to get the exact opposite, oh. honestly, here. But yeah, Nicholas. Ministers in the church uh, focus on the relationship from church and ministry. Yeah. And yeah, I think so. The ministers in the church, in other words, if I am in, um, if I'm in Wrigley, Wrigley Stadium, does that mean I'm a Cubs fan? No. no. Okay. Heaven forbid. Okay. <laughs> Heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. <laughs> Mark, okay? And so, yeah, I, I look at your upside down Cubs thicker every day and I'm uh, glad it's upside down. Um, <clears throat> so, and no, I'm just in that stadium, but I'm not of that stadium, okay? You get it? So I'm not of that. That's not my people. I'm not of that stadium. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. And so if I'm a minister in the church, it implies a uh, provenance from somewhere else. And what is that outside provenance? Christ himself. And so I'm a minister in the church sent by Christ himself. But if I'm a minister of the church, it sounds like I'm just one of the dudes of that church, deputized, empowered by them. I'm part of that. And that's why the difference in the, in the preposition matters. Is it in or of? Okay, so that's enough. Then we have another Tappert edition. This is a, even more significant, page 295, the second indebted paragraph, the first full one. And this is straight from, Ant, straight from Tappert, this is from the Apology. And notice how Tappert translates it and then what Nagel does. It is the mandate of God that ministers of the gospel absolve those who are converted, as it is said in 1 Corinthians 10, the authority which the Lord gave us for building you up. And now what's interesting is Tappert deletes us. So now we have the authority God gave for building you up. And so now it's just like it's given, but in the actual translation of the confessions, it's gave us, in other words, the men in the office. And so Tappert is taking, making little subtle moves, basically taking the teeth out and making Pastor look like he's not such an important thing, trying to elevate the people. It's that zero-sum game. All right, now, 295 is probably the part I want you to remember the most. This is the last 15 lines or so, four lines into that final incomplete paragraph. They all run together. 
It is not of the way of faith of gospel, faith gospel to cut into pieces and attempt to prove what pieces can be done without. So you don't try to go to the minimal thing here. We are invited to rejoice in the many ways the Lord has given for the giving of his gifts. This excludes the logic which concludes that since the forgiveness given a fellow Christian by a royal priest is no other forgiveness than given by a pastor in holy absolution, royal priest and pastor are the same, or only, differ only in degree. And see now, he's getting at exactly what we were asking about a few weeks ago. It's the logic of, well, come on. If I get the absolution at 9.15, why do I need the Lord's Supper at 9.45? Weren't, weren't my sins all forgiven? And if my brother forgives me in the dorm on Friday night because I kind of screwed up and I felt bad about it and I confessed to him and he forgave me, why do I need to go Sunday and confess again and get more forgiveness? Wasn't I forgiven? What do I, what's the point? And his, his whole argument is, don't slice apart what belongs together. And don't start trying to do the logic of what's the bare minimum. How much do I really need? You're missing the whole point. You're missing the whole point. We're not trying to go minimal here. You try to go minimal and you're missing what's going on. So then he goes on. To measure degrees and quantify is the way of the law and turns from the way of the gospel and the gift given. That is classic Norman. Each gift is each gift is each its own precious gift, gladly to be received and not to be measured or diminished by its likeness or unlikeness to another gift. Most precious is what can only be confessed of each gift, its proprium. There's a key, key word. I want you to get this and start using this idea. The proprium or the plural would be the propria. This is not, and this is not a it's technically a theological word, but it's a Latin term, which simply means what's appropriate or proper, and more exactly, what's specific of an individual. So, what's the proprium of a goldfish? Well, it swims in water, it can handle really cold water, it's cheap, that's the proprium of a goldfish. As opposed to the proprium of a puppy, would be it's cuddly and it's warm and it's a mammal and kids like puppies and puppies are much better pets than goldfish on some areas, even though they, you know, it's the whole thing. So what's the proprium of each pet? Get the idea? So I don't want you to think this word is only theological, it just means what's characteristic specific of a certain thing. Now, what's Nagel doing here with this whole point? His argument is, if the keys are given to the entire church, every single priest has the keys. Every one of you as priest has the keys. You have propria, which are unique to you, which allow you to give those keys and to use those keys in appropriate relationships because of your individual characteristics, which are tied dramatically to vocation. And what's cool is every propria shines in its own way. So let's go to a couple of illustrations I've given before and put, and put this in context. So a mother tells her son, no cookies until supper. Stay out of the cookie jar. And then 15 minutes later, she finds him in the cookie jar. And she, what are you doing? And the kid breaks down in sorrow. You know, oh, mom caught me and he's, she's, he's crying. I'm sorry, mommy, I disobeyed you. And so what does she say? I forgive you. And so does Jesus forgive you. Now, has she just used the keys? Yes. She has. Is that appropriate for her to do that? Absolutely appropriate. In fact, it would be just weird beyond belief for her to say, I'm calling the pastor right now. We're going to go down to the church and have him forgive you. <laughs> be a little bizarre. Junior would be, you know, whoa. And so besides, it's not, something's missing there. Okay? So let's go to husband-wife situation. So a husband messes up. It really hurts his wife, confesses. And she looks at him and says, I forgive you. It's hard, but I forgive you. God does, let's get this thing right. Is that appropriate for her to do this? Is that, that's demanded of her vocation. What would be too weird is the pastor stepping in and saying, let me assure you of your forgiveness. Now, it might be that the man is so bothered by his particular sin that it still nags at him. And then he goes to see the pastor and he gets forgiven for the same sin again. But what's different now? Well, see, the first one had the propria of wife. And did he need to hear that from her? Desperately. But now he goes to the pastor. What's, her, what's different about this? What's the, what's the propria at work now? Now I've got the dude who's wearing the stole. Now I've got the dude who's got the big A. He's the absolution man. And when he talks, it's like Christ himself has said it. Boy, I can be sure of it now. My wife is cool, but she's not God. And the pastor's darn close. You might say, whoa. But see, that's exactly the point. The appropriate the pastor brings is, I'm in the office. Believe it. 
And so now he can go home and say to his wife, man, the pastor forgave me. And I know you did, and it was cool. But when he forgave me, man, it rocked. Whew, I feel good. You see, this is exactly what's right. Now, is one forgiveness better than the other? They're just different. And was the grace given by the wife a different grace than the grace given by the pastor? No. And how much grace did she give him? 100%. All of it. How much did he give him? All of it. See, this is the point Nagel's trying to make. And this is the power of the keys when we get it. You don't go running around figuring out, now is that my territory or yours? You know, I don't think you should be doing that. This is reserved for me. This is stupid talk. Everybody does what's given them to do. And when the church is functioning at full blast the way it's supposed to, we're not pitting these against each other. So the mother forgiving, the wife forgiving, the friend sharing the gospel with a friend, it's the most appropriate thing to do. So your friend comes to you and says, I'm in the middle of a divorce. I'm going nuts here. I don't know if I, you know what God wants me to do anymore. What am I supposed to do? You say, well, I'll make an appointment for talk to my pastor. He'll straighten you out. You don't want to talk to your pastor. He doesn't know your pastor. He won't say a word to your pastor. Who's he want to talk to? You, the guy he knows. So open your mouth and do the keys, dude. It's appropriate. It's right. It's the proprium that's quite right. Now, in another situation, maybe the pastor is the one to do it. So when the pastor is speaking publicly on behalf of the church, doing means of grace, he's the one who does it. So the priest doesn't sit there. The mother say, hey, I forgave my kid last night. Let me take a shot at it this morning in church. No, sit down, woman. It's not your proprium. It's not right. Sit down. Go home and forgive your kids. I'll do the thing here. I'm the pastor. You getting the idea here? You don't pit them against each other. Let them shine in their appropriate. That's exactly what Nagel's getting at. And all of it's so crazy located. Beautiful. All right, saw a hand or two. <laughs> when um, another scenario, say, the kid comes to the mom and says, I did this terrible thing to Susie at school. Today, yeah. That would be, she couldn't forgive. Wow, no. See, here's where we start going then. So now you start helping him figure out what's going on. And she's going to look at the kid who's probably feeling guilty. And she probably will immediately absolve him. So he gets that, gets that figured out. You are for, you're forgiven. And it's okay, son. It's cool. Now, the thing is, though, your actions have actually hurt another person. And that relationship hasn't been healed by me forgiving you. You have a responsibility now to take, uh, let's figure this out. Let's go do it. Let's live fruits of repentance now. Okay? So she doesn't withhold the forgiveness. Bang, you deliver it. And you're going to do the same thing in your pastoral ministry. Guy comes in, confesses some horrible sin against his wife. She doesn't even know about it yet. So where do you start? You absolve him, give him the full, full deal. And you say, all right, now I'm here for you. Let's do the hard work. What's this going to look like? We've got a horizontal relationship to straighten out, and it's not going to be fun. Let's go do it. And off you go. Welcome to ministry. All right? Cool? All right. That's Nagel. Anything else? Um, tack on to Jim's point over there. What do you do when that uh, issue involves uh, illegalities also? Yeah, that gets so complicated because we have all this stupid stuff where people are worried about suits and jail and those kind of stuff. And, um, and I'm not trying to be facile about this, but man, there's something about the pastoral office which is kind of above all that. And that's that whole thing about in the ordination vow. One of the, you don't make many promises when you get ordained. You know, we'll look at the ordination vow later on, but you don't promise much. Well, what you do promise is, I will never divulge the sins revealed to me. And we need to take that really seriously. And I know, yeah, but wait, if it's a legal thing, you've got to report it. Good grief, why? So you don't go to jail? What matters more, saving your butt or being faithful? And so, you know, I get that. And I know we, we need to make sure that people aren't hurt, people aren't in danger. And the best thing to do then is you say, hey, you're telling me this in confidence, but we, this, we can't keep this in confidence. And if you are truly repentant, it's going to show. Like right now, you're going to take responsibility and let's get this thing figured out. And so then the ideal scenario is he admits, yeah, you're right. I've got to face the consequences. Let's go. And you, you work with him and you get that to happen. Now, how long you wait, how long you do this, that's going to be your judgment. You have to sort that stuff out. If someone's life is in, in a, you know, immediate danger, you don't allow you know, evil, evil to happen. You intervene in the best way you possibly can, whether it's an anonymous tip to somebody or whatever. There are things you can do which can accomplish this without you know, divulging, you know, everything you shouldn't be divulging. So you got to sort that out. But those, those are real things that can happen. I'm just saying, I think we need to hold the tension a little more carefully and not immediately just say, well, no, legally I'm bound, as if that's the end all. For crying out loud, legalities, frankly, don't matter nearly as much as spiritual realities as far as I'm concerned. 
The legality is just put you in, 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 in the red with the government. So what? And Paul lived that way. So do we. Aren't we supposed to follow the law? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. As long as they don't violate God's will. Acts 5. Come on. All right. Must have weighed God, not men. You know that. All right. What else we got from Nagel? All right. Now, notice in Marquardt, he's basically backing the whole thing up. These are short pages. This is his little excursus on Luber and the Uber Trogen Zlera. And the key thesis is right on top of 115. First full paragraph. The Hafling party, and Hafling is one of these guys doing the congregational side. The Hafling party overemphasized the spiritual priesthood at the expense of the office. The Leahy party did the reverse. It was the ecclesiological greatness of Walther that he held to both divine givens without yielding or shortchanging either. Bingo. This is exactly the argument Nail's making. Both from the Lord. So who's got the keys? Both in ways that are appropriate. So, do, do pastors have the keys from Christ himself? Yes. Do the people have the keys from Christ himself? Yes. What's the relationship between them? Non-competition. But, does one of them get to say, you know, well, we have it first, or we're really in charge? No. And we will go, we're going to play this out later when we get to congregational um, governance. But here's the thing you should already be thinking about. Who's then really in charge in the church? Is it really the voters' assembly, which you hear all the time? Ultimately, the voters' assembly are the real authority in the church. The pastor is under the voters. Is that what you get here? Who's really in charge in the church? Christ is. Christ is. See, okay, that's a nice spiritual answer. <laughs> but who's really in charge? And the answer is Christ is. And just stick to your guns on this, guys. It's not, well, ultimately the people are, or ultimately the pastor is. As soon as you make that concession one way or the other, you have lost the whole game. So should we cast it? lots instead? Ooh, Sometimes. Okay. Church did it, didn't they? Worked pretty well. Maybe actually trusting the Spirit then. What a crazy idea. I think we should do that. Ah, placement. Just throw the darts. <laughs> okay, here's the Dan Krismer dart. Thunk. Ah! Pensacola, Florida. Cool. Good for you, Dan. <laughs> oh, Greenland. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that again. Yeah. Oh, that corner's park, North Dakota. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> so what would we call our system? Clerical congregationalism? Our what? Our, our, our system? Yeah, our no, system. I don't know if we need it. I think we just need to call it. Or we just say it's ministry. <laughs> 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 church and ministry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one last thing before we're done here, page 116. Um, Marquardt makes a really nice case here, and he does it rather succinctly. He points out that Luther himself, at one time he interprets 1 Corinthians 14 as applying to the whole church. But then, 10 years later, when he's got enthusiasts breathing down his neck, he says, oh no, that only applies to pastors. And so, he, you know, he's, he's willing to change his tune according to which way the wind's blowing. And Luther will do this all the time. When he's got an argument that needs to be made, he'll make it. And if he needs to make a different argument five years later, he'll change his argument. He'll even change his position for the sake of that new argument. So be really careful when you're starting to pull Luther quotes out and say, well, Luther said, as if that ends every conversation. It shouldn't. You need to always keep things in careful balance. So I think Nagel's giving us the balance. And this, to me, is the answer to the raging questions in the church today of who's really in charge? What's the relationship between church and people? And the answer is both from the Lord. Let Christ be in charge. And people say, well, how's that work out in practicality? You just say every congregation sorts it out. Just deal with it and you start being church for a change. And instead of trying to have everything all pragmatically laid out in some neat little organization in a flow chart, why don't we just try being church? What a crazy idea. Blessings on the day, guys. Enjoy the symposium.